above conversation show. Subso Markets is the institutional division of Subso Bank Group, a leading fintech specialist that connects people to investment opportunities in global capital markets. Now, here to give us his insights on wealth management is Adam Reynolds. He's the CEO of Subso Capital Markets Asia Pacific. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brian. Great to be with you. Now, Adam, for a start, tell us a little bit about Subso Capital Markets and what you do in Asia. So, uh, so Saxo Bank is a, is a Danish bank, but we're very focused only really on investment and trading. And we've got one of the world's leading uh, platforms uh, for, for clients to, to, to invest and trade into the market. So in Asia, Singapore is our main hub, which is where I am based. Um, but we also have offices in, in Hong Kong, in Australia, in Japan. And, uh, and we've got some development uh, and fintech joint venture sitting in China as well. But really, we're here to provide access to the markets to individual investors and to, and to help them with their investment needs. OK, and when you talk about individual investors, what are the customer segments that you focus on? Well, we've been broadening that out for some time, Brian. You know, originally we were focused on the trader segment, um, offering sort of things like FX and leverage trading products. Um, to clients. Um, more recently, we've opened that up to uh, more investment type products where investors can choose their own uh, investments. And now more recently, once more, we've started to put an advisory platform together, a, a, a digital advisor, like a robo advisor, um, which is really targeting emerging affluence and mass affluent segments. So people who don't necessarily want to choose their own investments, but they are generating wealth and they want a good, uh, well-priced place to invest uh, for their futures. Okay, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that, Adam. But for a start, I want to get your insights on navigating the current market conditions. There's a lot of nervous investors out there. What should investors be who want to really protect and grow their wealth be considering? It's a great question, Brian, and it's a really difficult environment at the moment. You know, you've got to go back probably to 2007, 8, 9, to find another environment like this, which was, which was uh, very much uh, a withdrawal of uh, or a tightening of financial conditions in the market um, during the financial crisis. Um, you know, this, this is a, a, a unknown for a lot of people who have not had uh, the sort of many years in the market that, uh, that, that people like I have had. Um, so it is, for an investor, it, it's very difficult to, navigate these because you can get nervous and uh, you may want to exit investments when the market is down. But if you, if it, the most important thing I think for investors when they think about this is what are your goals? When are your goals coming due? And what do you need the money for? And if you have money that is invested that you need in the next 12 months, then it would be rational to not be invested in the market when it's like this. But if you've got money that you don't need for your know, three, five, ten years or until retirement, then you should be taking this opportunity to invest more into the market and to, to really have put together a plan for how you want to invest. We know in the long run that uh, you know, stocks perform with GDP and with, uh, with inflation, so they have a positive performance over time. So people don't want to get shaken out of their long-term investments by these sorts of moves. Secondly, Brian, I think it's important that uh, investors also understand their own risk appetite and their own loss aversion. So different people can sit down very happily, watch their portfolio go down by 20% and really not think much of it. Other people get very nervous in that, in that, uh, in that position and they may want to exit their portfolio. So really being honest with yourself about your risk appetite and your loss aversion is very important when you put your plan together and when you try and decide how much of your portfolio you want in safe investments like cash, like bonds, and how much you want in more risky, higher return investments like stocks. So I think those are the two things that people really have to think about. And Adam, so here's the challenge and here's the dilemma for a lot of people. There's a lot of younger people who have accumulated wealth in a very short period of time. And all their money is either in, in property or their businesses. So they're not very well diversified. Again, one of the strict no-nos in, in terms of investment. 
and they're really not sure what to do. They are very tech savvy. And this is where digital wealth management tools have obviously come in right now. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, robo-advisors are, are an example of that. Digital wealth managers have been very focused on client acquisition and delivering very low cost and solutions as well, which are low complexity, really basic solutions. But you've done a little bit more. You've just launched the Subso Wealth Care, which you've described as the first fifth generation digital wealth manager. Now, I don't know much about the, the history of it. You've been around in markets for a long time. Tell us more and walk us through the evolution of the first generation to the fifth generation. It's a great question, Brian. So, so actually the generations uh, were defined by Deloitte, at least generations one to four were, uh, in a paper that they wrote, I think, back in 2016, 2017. And the, and the first generation robo-advisors were very basic. It was around having a questionnaire um, and you take the answers and, and you define a portfolio for the client based on their answers to the questionnaire. That moved on re re relatively rapidly to um, the, the portfolio uh, activity, creating risk bucketed portfolios. And I just mentioned that people have to think about their own risk appetite and loss aversion. And that's where risk bucketed portfolios come in. So you think about someone who is more loss averse would have a lower risk portfolio with more stocks and uh, sorry, more bonds and more cash and less stocks. And someone who is uh, who is less risk averse, who's more willing to take risk, would have a higher risk portfolio with more stocks. Those risk portfolios are also uh, somewhat dependent on how old you are and how long you want to save for. The older you are, the more conservative you should be. And so you should have the lower risk bucket portfolio. So that really came around. That was generation two. Generation three is really where a lot of robo advisors are now. So they take these risk bucket bucketed portfolios. They'll constrain them with different rules. They'll have an auto rebalancing mechanism so that you don't end up with you know, the best performing stock becoming too big a concentration risk within your portfolio, or you end up having 45% in one stock and, uh, and nothing in anything else, but it's the one that, that performs the most. Uh, and they may overlay some thematics on top of that. But ultimately, you've still got risk bucketed portfolios. They're just, they're just being uh, rebalanced as the market moves to make sure that you don't get too much uh, lack of diversification within them. Then we move on to, to uh, the fourth gen. And fourth gen, really, there's not too many around at the moment. Certainly, um, from what we see, most of the ones in Asia have not got to the fourth generation yet. And the fourth generation is when you start having active risk management on the portfolio. So what happens is um, the, the way that uh, different people do that is they will effectively reduce risk as the market has a sell-off or a drawdown and then increase the risk back as the market returns up. There's a lot of financial uh, theory behind how to do that. Um, uh, Saxo Wealthcare does that as well. Um, we call it a dynamic portfolio protector and we use uh, a methodology that is, is fairly well described about how we do that. So that's the fourth generation. And what it does, it, it means that if a client, a client can opt in or opt out of this, by the way, if a client is, has loss aversion, then they would want to opt in to doing this so that they're not exposed to the really big drawdowns and they reduce their uh, risk as these drawdowns happen. You know, as it happens, I, I have my own uh, investment in Saxo Wealthcare. You know, I've been in the markets for a long time, but I also opt for the dynamic portfolio protector. Um, just because I think that it's a, it, it's a great methodology of risk managing the portfolio. Then the final generation, the fifth generation, which is really where Saxo Wealthcare has its own, uh, has the area to itself, is around the individual personalization of the goals and how your portfolio reacts as it gets closer to the goals. So we all know that if you've got a goal, Brian, to retire, and you're a young man in your mid-30s and you want to retire in, uh, <laughs> in time, you've got plenty of time. You shouldn't even be worrying about that. You should have a portfolio. When you get to my age, you know, 20 plus years older than you, I'm much closer to retirement and it's an important goal for me. So I should certainly have less risk. Now, we may have answered the questionnaire entirely the same way. We may have the same risk appetite, 
But as I get closer to retirement, the portfolio itself needs to dynamically allocate itself away from risk so that my goals are being more likely to be hit, i.e. I have less chance of a drawdown. So that's interesting because then it moves towards a more wealth protection rather than uh, uh, a growth of wealth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's it. That's exactly uh, where this fifth generation comes from. You know, you've got to optimize your portfolio for your goals, for the proximity of your goals and for the prioritization of your goals. So we let clients say, OK, this goal is critical to me. This goal is aspirational to me or this goal is important, but not critical. And, you know, the likelihood of you hitting that goal uh, is, is different depending on how you prioritize it. If it's critical, we make sure that in all the Monte Carlo simulations that you will hit it. So we will de-risk you at an earlier stage. But what this does, Brian, it, it, um, it personalizes the portfolio to every single individual. So even though we may have all of the same starting points, as soon as we put our goals in, we'll have different portfolios because your goals and my goals are not going to be the same. Okay, so that's a fundamental change then from earlier robo-advisors because essentially they have, and for, for lack of a better word, avatar customers and avatar portfolios. And then this becomes really deep personalization to an individual level. Have I sum- summarized that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so the engine around this personalization is, is something that's very, very new. And, uh, and, and most, uh, most robos that we've observed don't have it yet. And it does get you personalization to a level that's really very difficult to scale if you don't have an engine like Saxo has built for this. Um, because, because, uh, you know, we've made it so that anyone can get involved in having this sort of wealth management. And within your portfolios itself with, with this, uh, Saxo, uh, wealth care, what are the focus areas in terms of growth? Uh, are, are you looking at Asia? Is it global? You know, tell us a little bit of, 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 of some of the things that you look out for. Yeah, so, so we, we want to keep it relatively simple, Brian. So we, we put together three sort of base building blocks or base, uh, what we call, uh, I guess they're base portfolios, but I don't want to use the same word because the portfolios are individualized. But the building blocks really are where the starting points of your of your uh, investment are. So people can look for a global portfolio um, and it's a global portfolio with an Asia bias because typically when you look at MSCI world, it's heavily European biased uh, mm-hmm. relative to Asia. Um, and we know that in Asia, you know, people prefer to invest in this region rather than in, in the European region. So we have an MSCI uh, Asia biased global portfolio. We then have a, an Asian portfolio, which is much more Asia biased again. Right. It's, uh, it's much more focused on this region. All the investments are within the region, including you know, obviously a, a heavy investment in Greater China, uh, North Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, and then the final one is, is an ESG portfolio, um, which is uh, you know, very much focused on those people who would like to make a, uh, a difference uh, in the world and have an impact uh, with their investing. Interestingly, the ESG portfolio, when we look at the simulations, has a better potential return history than uh, the others, but they're all very close. And, okay. and, and, and what is probably most interesting is that in long run investing, it's not actually the stocks that you choose that make the difference. It is your asset allocation between risk and, uh, and low risk that makes the difference over the long term. And that is far more important than the actual individual assets in the portfolio. Now, Adam, let's get down to the brass tags. What are your fees like compared to your competitors? Oh, look, I think this is extremely well priced. So the, the, the building blocks for each of the portfolios is ETFs. And if you've got a robo-advisor that is building with, uh, with mutual funds, then you know that they're taking all the trailing commissions from the mutual funds because the mutual funds have very high fees in them. So we built it with very low-cost ETFs, which you know, have somewhere between 5 and 25 basis points of expense ratio in them, which is very, very low. On top of that, uh, we have a fee which is somewhere between 45 and 75 basis points, or 0.45, 0.75%, um, depending on how much you've invested. Um, and that's the only fee you pay. So we don't charge anything for the individual transactions um, because you know, 
because we have an active allocation methodology, we may be switching your portfolio around quite a bit. Um, and we don't want to, we don't want to erode your returns by having transaction fees. So there's zero transaction charges in there. Um, you're just paying that 0.45 to 0.75% depending on what your assets are. And Adam, I always ask this fee question because I've learned the hard way from past investments in unit trust and mutual funds where fees really take out a lot of your return. So this is a something that's very close to my heart. Yeah, I, I understand it, Brian. I mean, you know, if you have a, if you have a, if you invest in mutual funds which are taking say one and a half percent plus in uh, in management fees, then you know that can add up to a very substantial amount over a ten to fifteen year period. Um, you know, over fifteen years, it's the difference between, between retiring in fifteen years and retiring eleven years with the same amount of money. For that sort of uh, for that sort of fee level, which is which is quite a substantial number of extra years you need to work to re- to achieve your goals. Um, so yeah, I think the, the fees make a big difference. Now, Adam, I've got to ask you this: There's a lot of wealth management services out there from traditional wealth managers. You know, it's private bank, fintechs, and so forth. Um, what makes you special? What? Why should I, as an investor, um, trust Saxo in this space? Because you are, after all, better known as a broker. Yeah, I mean, Brian, it, it, it is a really good question. We are we are better known as a broker in Singapore, but certainly, you know, our real company uh, IP, uh, our real company culture, is around being a developer of, of technology for individuals and technology for individuals to access the markets and to invest. Certainly, we we started at the top end or the complex end of that with trade appliance and margin and you know, real-time monitoring of positions. Uh, but as we've broadened out, we've, we've applied the same sort of technology know-how to build these portfolios that we have in Saxo Wealthcare. And the reason I think people should trust Saxo is because we do have such a strong ability to develop um, high-quality platforms uh, for people to access the markets and also to, to think about their investments overall, which is why we have, you know, we are the backbone for quite a few of the other uh, digital wealth managers outside of Saxo itself. And, and this brings me to another point. There is a, a, a view that uh, investors are underserved in the wealth management space at the moment. Do you subscribe to that? Well, I think that the traditional IFA market um, is a difficult market. That they, they tend to be, uh, they don't tend to have the technology budgets to develop that business further, and they tend to buy products which have high trailing commissions and, and will pay the financial advisor quite a lot for his, uh, for his advice. So I don't think they necessarily do what is best for the client. Um, I think banks find it very hard to personalize anything. Um, you know, they just don't have the, the they don't have the, the skill set to develop the technology to personalize investments for, um, for the mass affluent and even the high net worth space. You need to be in the ultra high net worth private bank, you know, $10 million plus bracket for the banks to really think about personalizing a portfolio for you. Otherwise, they're looking to sell you a product. So I think that people are underserved in both of those areas where most of what it is about is putting products into your portfolio rather than thinking about how you as an investor are going to you know, grow your wealth to achieve your goals in the future. Now, Adam, um... With all your experience, could you share with the audience what are some fundamental wealth management tips that you'd like to share, especially when it comes to growing their wealth and, uh, you know, mindsets perhaps that are holding people back? Brian, it is all about mindset, 100%. You know, it doesn't matter what your, you know, what your role, uh, what your job is or, or anything like that. It doesn't matter how much money you have. To, to accumulate wealth over time, it is about understanding your own risk appetite and your own loss aversion first and foremost, and, under, and, and then building a portfolio and committing yourself to that portfolio over time, over the long term. If you start doing that at a younger age, you know, when you first start working, even with small amounts of money, it will give you a habit of investing, which is a great habit to get into, and it will get you into that mindset where you don't fear the the drawdowns that may be happening at, at this moment. 
The way I see the market at the moment, we've had both bonds selling off and stocks selling off for some time. April was the worst month for both bonds and stocks in some time. Um, you know, it provides an opportunity for people to start investing who haven't yet and to start putting it into, you know, conservative portfolios where they can feel that as they start uh, uh, investing, even if the market goes down, they're investing at a lower price. We call that dollar cost averaging. Mm-hmm. And as people you know, start to build their wealth, they should think about how much they can contribute over time and just get started. It's, it's, it's as good a time as any now, probably better than if you started six to nine months ago when the market was near a peak because you're, you're starting at a level where the market has come down some. And uh, for me, I think uh, you know, it's a great time for us to be launching this product. Now, Adam, there's, there's a, also another scenario that is not talked about a lot, but seems to constitute quite a lot of our audience. There are a lot of business owners who perhaps most of their wealth has been tied up in their business, or they have uh, their primarily their wealth is locked up in property and their business. And what they've done is many of them have not contributed to a superannuation or EPF or CPF, which, whichever it is, because they've just focused on growing, growing their business. And now they're in their late 40s, their early 50s. Uh, they suddenly realize, hey, I have actually a little bit of money and I need to start really thinking around retirement. What advice would you give this particular group of people who basically uh, are quite numerous across the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, it, uh, I think really it's a, it's a, firstly about cash flow. You know, if, you're, if your business is generating cash uh, and you are, are starting to be able to take some of that cash out of the business without, without um, you know, damaging the business, then really diverting stuff away from the business and starting to build a portfolio which is separate to the business makes a lot of sense, um, especially because you need that diversification. You know, people get very uh, involved in their business and want to put all their money into it, and that, you know, that's required because it's hard to get bank financing when you're starting a business, so you have to plow your own resources back in. But as the business starts to generate cash, which is, of course, you know, the long-term goal of all businesses, um, taking that out and building a portfolio that is separate to the business and to a certain extent, you know, you want it in separate segments to your business, you know, it makes a lot of sense. If you have a business which is very uh, um, linked to how the market is performing, the stock market overall, then you should take a more conservative portfolio, I think, with the money that you take out and just think of your business as one factor in your overall portfolio. And again, this is where... Um... I think some of your the, the discussions that we had earlier in terms of asset allocation will really come into play. Now, Adam, it's been a fascinating conversation. But before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with? Yeah, look, I, I mean, for me, I think that the market at the moment is ha, does still have some more downside. I, I, I think that the um, tech stocks are very overvalued. Uh, I think that the commodity stocks, commodity producers... Uh, are where you should be investing uh, if you are a day-to-day investor who wants to who wants to look after your own portfolio, um, because I do think there's more downside for for tech stocks. But notwithstanding that, you know, taking this opportunity of much cheaper stocks and much cheaper bonds to start building your portfolio and to put an investing plan into place and sticking to that plan, that's the greatest piece of advice that I can give to anyone. Now, Adam, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks very much for having me again. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez, and we've been speaking to Adam Reynolds, the CEO of Saxo Capital Markets Asia Pacific, on BizTax Wealth Conversation Show. Now, this video and podcast will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our social media platforms. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in. Mm-hmm.